Welcome to another edition of the Charleston Leadership Interviews. My name is Meg White. I am a senior consultant at Delta Think and a director of the Charleston Conference. Today, we are delighted to be talking with Steve Fallon, who is president of DeGreuter and actually a longtime member and participant as part of the Charleston community. So Steve, welcome today. We're so glad that you're here. And again, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great. So um, you've had an eventful last 12 months, so a lot to talk with you about today. Um, you know, I was like, do I want to say busy? But I, I think probably busy and eventful. So just to kick off, talking about your new role, um, you became president of DeGreuter, as we mentioned in the introduction, just earlier this year in 2023. So I'd like to start with that. If you could talk a little bit about that, what are you excited about? Um, and, and what do you see perhaps in a very, very rapidly changing scholarly ecosystem, the organization's biggest challenges slash opportunities? Challenge always brings opportunity. So what 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 are you looking forward to? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I was I was appointed as uh, president for the DeGroder Inc. So I oversee the Americas uh, on behalf of the company. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I'm responsible for what we call the service arm of our business, uh, which is a combination of our partner program, our ubiquity, and our Ciendo uh, business units. Um, you know, collectively, I think uh, DeGroder boasts a pretty long history. You know, it spans more than 275 years and having been with the company for the last 13 years, um, it's really clear that that um, that the people that work with DeGuarda take great pride in, in the legacy of DeGuarda as an academic publisher. Um, numerous books have actually been dedicated to chronicling the journey, journey of the publishing house. And I think that with my role and given the direction uh, that the company would like to move, I'm pretty enthusiastic about uh, what I think is really kind of my the chance for me to add my own chapter to this narrative uh, during what I think is a pretty pivotal time in, uh, in the evolution of scholarly publishing. As, as from the perspective of, uh, in answer to your question about challenges, um, you know, from the perspective of a scholarly publisher and a service provider, I think navigating the financial sustainability of monograph book publishing in the humanities and social sciences uh, remains a significant and ongoing challenge. I would even raise it uh, to uh, to the level of being mission critical. Um, I think that right now what we're seeing is that the uh, the academic market is kind of witnessing this, this growing demand for increased openness and bibliodiversity and accessibility to the uh, peer-reviewed long-form scholarly scholarship. And, and I think publishers are grappling with the task of becoming more accessible while also maintaining financial viability. From my perspective, the challenges faced by DeGorder uh, differs from those of our of our partners, such as our university presses or independent uh, scholarly publishers. Uh, for the most part, this distinction arises from the fact that we own our own platform and we offer a unique advantage compared to entities dependent upon third parties. Uh, that said, uh, the unique characteristic position us quite nicely as a valuable service provider, as we ultimately understand the, the needs and the demands for our partners uh, in this dynamic landscape. So. Yeah, so the the, uh, the the challenges around financial sustainability are, are quite clear, and in light of these challenges, kind of we have this opportunity to leverage our strengths as a legacy publisher, uh, ingrained with the DNA built on collaboration, innovation, and a strong technical infrastructure, uh, to better engage our partners, authors, and the library community. Well, and I love um, there's so many aspects to that answer, but I I do. I think sometimes in a world that's so driven by the, the, the speed of innovation, the experience and the knowledge and the context of a legacy publisher sometimes gets lost. So I love that you kind of bought that in as, you know, we're adapting, but we're not throwing out this really rich history that 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 we have and we know is is critically important. So um Building on that, um, also this year, an eventful year for, for you and, and for DeGreuter itself. Brill and DeGreuter recently agreed to merge two of, of the oldest and most storied humanities publishers in academic publishing. Can you talk a little bit about why this or why this came about and, and what the impact will be to humanities publishing and scholarship and, and maybe a little bit even about what it will mean specifically for libraries? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, believe it or not, it's not very often that a 275 year old publishing house buys one that's uh, or is attempting to buy because we have to keep in mind that the deal is not uh, closed yet. Uh, we're attempting to buy uh, a publishing house that's actually quite older than ours uh, by over 65 years. Believe it or not, Bill's uh, uh, has its own is is in and of its own uh, Bill is in and of its own right an esteemed publishing house. Uh, over 340 years old in the humanities and social sciences. And uh, they, align, they align quite strategically well with the quarter. Um, you know, we're really excited about the opportunity. And I think there is a compelling rationale behind the transaction that is quite clear uh, for those all of those stakeholders in our community uh, around um, both publishing houses. Uh, together, we uh, I think the quarter and Bill, Bill both share a deep commitment to publishing excellent research and and our, our programs uh, from content-wise seem to seamlessly uh, complement each other. In terms of impact, I, I think you mentioned the point about legacy and the, and the importance of it. And I, I can't agree more. It's really kind of built into who we are uh, and what we're trying to accomplish. And to me, I think uh, in terms of impact, what resonates most is the commitment that was made by the chairman of our board uh, that the Gorder and Brill will endure uh, for centuries to come. So this idea of not only legacy, but also preservation is probably the biggest impact around this uh, acquisition. Uh, and to me, it represents, you know, it repre represents the utmost advantage, this idea of kind of safeguarding our individual legacies. Uh, in terms of the book, the book on you know, the chapter and the books written about both Brill and DeGuarter, you know, this is a pretty exciting time. And I would say also a pretty exciting chapter. In terms of what it means for libraries, I think I think there are some real issues, as we mentioned, in terms of the challenges that are that we face around the um, financial sustainability of the mission-driven monograph, and and this consolidation um, is anticipated to kind of provide that necessary scale for investing in technology, workflows, platforms, and overall kind of uh, ultimately enhancing the author experience while expanding our services to libraries and academic institutions worldwide. Staying on that, and you've, you've talked about financial sustainability a couple of times in order to continue the mission, right? Um, De Gruyter has really been an innovator in developing alternative book funding models, and as you mentioned, st the supporting infrastructure. Can you talk a little bit about eBound and, and why De Gruyter has taken a leadership role? I, I, I think most people would say a leadership role in this area. Sure, I think that one of the one of the nice things about um, about our office in Boston and the kind of support that we have uh, from the company worldwide is our ability to kind of be uh, is the support we see for that that innovation and, and this idea of responding to the market and and I think that the models and not and even a not for profit the not for profit is the Gorder that we created uh, in 2022 all of that was in response to the call from the market and we've been agile enough as an organization to to listen and then and then we've had the support. Um, we have had support from our from our CEO. We've had support from our board to make investments while listening to the market. And so it started with the Gorder Ebound. And, and when we created the Gorder Ebound, we knew that we wanted to support some of those ongoing themes uh, that I mentioned earlier. This idea of diversity, digital diversity, and accessibility, and and open access. And what's unique about that challenge is that. Um, is that you know to be open and to be accessible doesn't mean doesn't need to be open access. I think that there's a lot of people that would say that it does, uh, but there's also this reality that uh, in business and to be financially sustainable, we need to have this paywall content. And so the uh, the not for profit uh, took upon itself kind of the mission to really investigate this space and see what could we do for mission driven scholarly publishers. Uh, what could we do to support them? Um, in this space uh, with financial sustainable models as well as scalable models. And so, and so recently, I think on the back of our, of our service program and taking advantage of uh, some of the acquisitions that DeGuarda had, had earlier with Ubiquity, uh, we're uniquely positioned with the technology, uh, with the commitment from our university press partners, as well as, um, I think our our position in this space to kind of bring together this community, this what I call, like to call the like mindedness in our community, 
uh, to bring everyone together to identify, you know, what are the challenges and what are the opportunities and then what are we going to do about it more, more importantly. And so together, um, you know, Dubois Ebound has uh, um, supported uh, the Dubois organization as well as our stakeholders in launching what we're calling the University Press Library Open Business Model. Uh, that brings together presses, library, consortia, vendors, authors, institutions, and funding bodies in this open access initiative. initiative. And I think what's unique about the Gorder Ebound is, you know, we're learning a lot from, you know, previous um, previous business models, you know, Luminos, Tome, Opening the Future. And it's these previous initiatives that allow us to learn a lot about what is scalable, what is financially sustainable, and then how do we distribute that the financial responsibility more equitably across the whole ecosystem? Um, and that's the only way that we're going to ensure, I think, this idea of long-term sustainability for open access. So one of the one of the challenges in doing so is who was going to own it, who was going to manage the model, who was going to bring together the stakeholders, um, and who was going to manage the day to day. And that's where Dubota Ebound comes in. And we have this opportunity that are not for profit uh, and a very mission-driven approach with a board that's made up of uh, university press directors and academic librarians uh, to together work with us um, in efforts to create this more predictable and sustainable uh, publishing ecosystem for academic publishers and libraries uh, through this open access initiative. Uh, and so I think we've we've done a good job so far uh, and we, we'd like to think that we um, are in this unique position to uh, take it to the next step. Well, and it's so interesting, um, it, you know, it, the humanities publishing, as opposed to so often some of these new funding models are being led by the STEM and the STEM disciplines. Um, I think there's a lot of data out there that says many times the answer to these questions is discipline or even subject specific. So it, it's it's been impressive to see DeGroyder step up and say, you know, this is our space. We are a valuable part of this ecosystem. We are going to investigate, assertively investigate how this is going to be, how this kind of scholarship is going to be sustainable. Um, so um, it's been it's been fascinating to watch, and um, we'll definitely stay tuned for for what's coming next in that area. So, switching channels a little bit, um, you are a longtime participant uh, at Charleston, a longtime attendee. Um, what were your thoughts on the conference in twenty twenty three? Uh, things that you were interested in, um, you know, how was the vibe as opposed to uh, previous years down there in Charleston? Yeah, I have to say it's always the highlight on the calendar, um, and and it and it never gets old. I think every time I go to Charleston, it's it's always fun to walk the streets and to uh, not only experience uh, kind of the ambiance that is the city of Charleston, but then also um, the opportunity uh, to engage directly with stakeholders. It's um, it's the best conference by far to bring together you know this idea of this this community and to have I think meaningful uh, meaningful discussions. And so every year I really look forward to it. And um, and this year was was no different. I think we uh, not only with great attendance, it's really nice to be back in person and it's just I think the larger this felt like it was more people than it has been in the years past since COVID. And so that was really nice. You know, I think that what was clear about the the, the twenty twenty three conference was that it was it was apparent that open access was the predominant theme. Um, I felt like it occupied a majority of the sessions. And, and now while I think open access and the focus on open access is crucial, I think uh, I would say a bit of feedback would be that a more diverse representation of paywall content within the sessions would have been beneficial. I found it interesting that some of the uh, commercial entities were having meetings outside of the sessions that were kind of uh, putting together their own agenda. And I worry a little bit that those agendas are driven, you know, without the voice of the Charleston community. What's great about the sessions is that they bring together. Uh, I think a librarian has to be in every session and uh, run the session and, and really offers more of a, um, more of that direct engagement. Uh, but the reality is that open access is gaining traction and, um, and it's an important topic that all of us need to engage and discuss on the book side as well as the journal side. Uh, that being said, it still represents, I think, still a um, relatively small portion of the content landscape and engaging in these discussions, specifically around the topics, as I, as I mentioned, of financial sustainability 
uh, and the role of urban access in that um, is, is really essential for our community. So um, but Charleston continues to be that place where you have these conversations and uh, and I think, again, this year was no different in terms of the impact of our organization and the opportunities that come with it. So it's really good. It's interesting when you were talking earlier about um, eBound and, and how it was collaborative. One of its key pillars was collaboration between these different stakeholders and, and DeGroyter really saw, you know, you're, you're bringing people together. I was thinking about Charleston. You know, because that that the, those two things really echo in my mind. Um, you know, it really is. You know, being a longtime director, it there is great care taken to make sure that all of the stakeholder voices are. Uh, we there's an environment where all these different folks can actually collaborate to hopefully find solutions or sometimes not perhaps, but um, said so that's sort of the intent. So it's interesting the way, you know, the Greuter's doing that as an organization, but also participating in that in the broader ecosystem during the conference. So anyway, thanks for that. All good. If I may, Meg, I, you know, I, sh I should share that it was in 2014 at the Charleston conference that kind of launched Arm Pyre Service Arm. So uh, it was the meeting between the consortia, library, publisher, and aggregator uh, meeting. And I don't know if many people know, you walk up the steps at the Marion Hotel and to the right, there's this there's this little round table in the back corner. And it was in that meeting that we had in 2014 that, um, that, that, that again, the opportunity to bring together these stakeholders that say, hey, there's a really serious problem when it comes to accessing digital content for uh, university presses and and what are you going to do about it was the was the call from the library and the consortium in the room and and yeah that kind of launched our whole service arm and uh, that led to down the road to this model and to the quarter ebound so in many respects we we owe charleston for that opportunity there's no better success story in terms of of the intent i can tell you of the directors and the organizers and i'm sure um hopefully that's one of many stories of that kind of collaboration over the history of the conference and and moving into the future so um thanks for sharing that that was fantastic so focusing on you this is a chance for for the charleston community to get to know the real Steve Fallon. <laughs> I don't know. Um, do, can you talk a little bit about what do you do when you're not, um, you know, expanding access to um, scholarship and humanities uh, content? Yeah, so I, th I think when I'm not working, I, you know, I like working a lot with my hands. I, I consider myself uh, a wannabe kind of plumber, electrician, carpenter, and landscape architect. <laughs> There's something you said about just kind of getting your hands dirty and connecting physically with your environment and it just kind of re-energizes me. And so I, I do a lot of that and my wife really appreciates it in my honey do list. Uh, never, never, uh, never, never goes away seemingly, but, uh, but it's something, it's a labor of love and I really appreciate doing that. Um, I think when I'm not uh, working on the house, I, I try to pretend to play golf. I don't know if you really call it that, but I, I go out there and I enjoy this for hours or, or I also, a, a try and attempt to play video games with uh, my son. So I really enjoy those moments of, of being present and spending time with him. Well, you're a better person than me if you can sit down and master those little thumb-driven <laughs> controller things. But um, yeah, I'd love to hear that you're handy around the house. And I can say if you were in my household, you would be getting high march for that. So well done. And um yeah, I putter around in the yard myself, and and I really do think I think um, the the feeling you get when you successfully complete a task um, it, it immediately in the present. So many of the problems we wrestle with professionally are you know they're long term problems. They don't get solved overnight. But you know, trimming the hedge generally, you can step back and and admire your accomplishment pretty quickly. So um, love that, love that. So. We're coming to the end here, um, and this has been so terrific. And thanks so much for, for sharing a little bit of more professional context and also some of your personal information. Is there anything else that, that you'd like to share with the Charleston Hub community? Yeah, I think I think what's what's um, I think I think we've been uniquely positioned. I think the water in our role has been pretty uniquely positioned in terms of the space and the intersection between as an aggregator and publisher working with other publishers and then this whole community being. And I, one of the things that I've, I've recently have um, come to appreciate is 
is a lot of the work that our university press partners have done in terms of making their content globally accessible. And I think that we're, it's still early for us. I know there's initiatives right now to, uh, to identify um, usage of open access books, but I would also argue that the um, that our university press partners are are making a global impact in their ability to have their content available on third party platforms in the global environment in just ways that we can't comprehend. I think we're having the conversation about um, about the right things. I think with, um, when it comes to openness and accessibility and bibliodiversity, but what's actually happening? Um, I don't think we're we're seeing the data on that, and I can share that what what insights I have had and what data I have been able to see, it's been remarkably impressive. Uh, and I don't think that our university press partners are quite getting um, the recognition for the work that they're actually doing. So, so I think there is a, this uh, further call and further part of of our uh, like-mindedness that we kind of get together and um, investigate that a little bit more deeply in 2024. So I hope that that happens. It's interesting. And, and you know, I, I think... You were talking earlier about financial sustainability. You know, there's so many questions specifically around humanities publishing and, and you know, the path forward. This this clearly is one of the options for the path forward. How do you make this kind of scholarship sustainable? Um, I agree. There's tons of work being done there and being able to sort of recognize that and to build on that to make it more scalable and more widespread. Um, you know, good things coming. In, in 2024 and De Gruyter, certainly, as we mentioned, on the front lines of a lot of that. So thanks for all that work. And congratulations to you on your new role um, here in North America and, and your leadership within the organization. And uh, we'll certainly be watching this space, as we said, in 2024. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Steve, take care. Appreciate your time today. And um, happy, happy new year. And um, we'll let you go. Thank you. Thank you.